Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about science for better living. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki, episode 144, recorded Thursday, May 17th, 2012. Science for Better Living. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki, and this is the show where you get to dig into a topic in the sciences for an entire hour. I get to talk with somebody for an hour about their field of expertise, and it's really not very often in this world that you get to sit back, relax, and learn from people who know what they're talking about. And today, I hope you're ready because we are going to dig into science based medicine and um, pretty much how science-based medicine can help you live better longer with our guest, Dr. David Agus. He's an oncologist and the author of The End of Illness. He's written a book. It's a New York Times bestseller, and we'll be speaking with him in just a few minutes. But first, as always, a few science headlines. It's May 17th, 2012, and these are the stories that made headlines for this week. Do naked mole rats hold the secret to a longer life? Well, maybe, maybe not. But what they do have is a lot of brain protein called NRG1. The uncommonly long-lived rodent was compared against six other rodent species of varying longevities and found to have the most of this particular neuroprotective growth factor, the levels of which remain high throughout their lives. NRG1 is known to drop in, in humans as we age, and it's thought that this protein might be one mechanism responsible for allowing these animals, these naked mole rats, to age gracefully. A gene called PRKCA was linked to both good memory and post-traumatic stress disorder by European researchers. The study sequenced the DNA of volunteers to determine that there are two gene alleles, the A allele and the G allele. Volunteers with two copies of the A allele had the best memories for the details of pictures they were shown, whereas people with two copies of the G allele had the worst memories. People with an A and a G were somewhere in the middle. Brain scans showed that brain activity in areas of the brain involved in encoding emotional memories was higher in people with two copies of the A allele. Additionally, the A allele was overrepresented in individuals who had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. The moral to this story is that the genes that give you great memory abilities might also curse you with remembering too much. A paper in Nature reports a finding that might explain why some individuals are more prone than others to Alzheimer's disease. It's known that having two copies of the ApoE4 gene increases a person's risk by eight to ten times that of someone who doesn't. But the mechanism that leads to the increased risk has remained elusive. This study finds that ApoE4 triggers a signaling cascade involving a compound called cyclophilin A that makes the brain's blood vessels leaky and allows toxic substances that are normally kept out to pass through. It's this process that leads to neuronal death and if stopped in time could potentially prevent the development of the disease. The world's oldest cave art was discovered engraved in a 1.5 metric ton block of limestone in southern France. According to a report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, carbon dating determined that the engravings and other artifacts found at the site are 37,000 years old, and additional analysis identifies it as Orignacian in origin. Experiments measuring the effects of climatic warming on plant growth and flowering are coming up short. According to a review study in the journal Nature that compared real-world observations of approximately 1,500 plant species to the results of warming experiments involving 115 species, plants are flowering about four days earlier per degree Celsius of warming than predicted from the experiments. This mismatch suggests that experiments aren't taking all the appropriate variables into account and that the ecosystem models that depend on these numbers to predict the effects of a warming climate won't be making accurate predictions until the researchers figure this one out. How can the Gila monster help you with your diet? 
through its spit. That's right, a compound called Exendin 4, which is found in the saliva of the Gila monster lizard, reduces food cravings in rats by suppressing the reward and motivation areas of the brain. The findings imply that the compound could be used to treat overeating, alcoholism, gambling, and other vices relating to cravings. Interestingly, a synthetic form of the compound is already available to treat type 2 diabetes under the drug name Exenatide. And scientists from the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley Livermore Laboratory created an electric generator based on viruses. The harmless M13 bacteriophages were specifically engineered for enhanced piezoelectric strength and stacked 20 layers thick into a film smaller in size than a postage stamp. Pressure to the film produced enough energy to power a, li- a liquid crystal display, up to 6 nanoamperes of current and 400 millivolts potential. Still qu- not quite enough power to run your phone, but definitely a step in the right direction. For the first time, surgeons from the Washington University School of Medicine report the successful use of nerve transfer to restore partial limb function in a quadriplegic patient. The surgeons rerouted working nerves in the arm to connect to nerves that join the spine above the injury at the C7 vertebrae. And in another amazing feat of movement, neurosurgeons involved in the BrainGate 2 clinical trial report that two paralyzed study participants were able to control a robotic arm using the power of their brains and some computer technology. The arm was controlled via a neural implant and used to reach for, grasp, and hold various objects. And finally, are coffee drinkers any healthier? A study published today in the New England Journal of Medicine suggests that drinking coffee might be associated with lower mortality risk as you age. The authors used data from the American Association of Retired Persons study, which gathered the coffee drinking habits of over 400,000 people between the ages of 50 and 71. It was found that even though caffeine has been shown to have negative health effects, Drinking up to six cups per day might help keep the coffin away. Now it's time to talk to our guest. And I've been looking forward to speaking with our guest this week. Dr. David B. Agus is one of the world's leading cancer doctors and oncologists and pioneering biomedical researchers. Over the past 20 years, he's received acclaim for his innovations in medicine and contributions to new technologies that are going to change how all of us maintain our health. He's also built a reputation for having a unique way of looking at the relationship of the body to health and disease. He's a professor of medicine and engineering at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine and the Viterbi School of Engineering and heads USC's West Side Cancer Center and the Center for Applied Molecular Medicine. He received his bachelor's degree from Princeton, his MD from the University of Pennsylvania. He trained at Johns Hopkins and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He's a staunch advocate for personalized medicine. He is the co-founder of Applied Proteomics and Navigenics, and uh, his awards and honors include the American Cancer Society Physician Research Award, a Clinical Scholar Award from the Sloan Kettering Institute, and the 2009 Joffrey Bean Foundation's Rock Stars of Science Award. He's also the author of the recent book, The End of Illness. And without any further ado, or any more introductions from this uh, long list of, of wonderful things that he's worked on through his life, I uh, am proud to introduce David Agus. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiki. It's great to be here. Yeah. And so first thing off the top is not related to your book, but how does it feel to be a rock star of science? You know, I did it, um, and I did it with some great people. So it was Francis Collins, myself, and a bunch of other scientists to get young kids excited about science. And that's what I believe in. The next generation of scientists aren't going to be you or I. It's going to be the teenagers. You know, when Kennedy said we're going to put a man on the moon, people thought he was crazy. Nine years later, Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. The average age of missile command when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon was 27. So it's those kids that are going to make the difference. And I wanted to find a way to make science exciting for them. I, I think it, it was just a, a fabulous thing to be a part of. I've often thought that rock stars in this country, sports stars in this country get a lot of attention, but scientists don't really get as as much attention. And so it's, I think it's important to portray in a really positive light all the wonderful things that, uh, that people like yourself are doing to affect our future. It's great. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. Okay, so I am. Um, you, you've obvious. You obviously have a strong uh, position on on science and uh, believe that science-based medicine is important. Um, 
I was, I'm wondering, though, if you can talk a little bit about the role of science in medicine, because I'm really intrigued by your position as a professor of both medicine and engineering. So, you know, my field, medicine, and I'm a cancer doc, we've been very reductionist in how we approach disease. Let's understand how the molecule signals and how it hits the nucleus and how everything changes in the cell. And we forget that disease in the body are a complex emergent system. We got fooled by germ theory, right? Germ theory in the 30s and 40s said, you identify the bacteria, you know the treatment. That bacteria doesn't care if you're short, round, tall, green, or red. The problem with other diseases, heart disease, cancer, brain disease, is that they're from within, not without. And in those cases, this complex emergent system, we may never understand the true complexity, yet we should be able to control it. We should figure out ways that we can control the system doesn't require a level of understanding. And that's a maturity there that it took me a long time to uh, get to. And it's something that most scientists won't admit to. Hmm. Well, I think, yeah, I th- well, science, scientists themselves are definitely into the understanding. You know, you want, it's always searching, f- having new questions and figuring out and following the path. It's that, that curiosity-driven approach. Um, so what you're saying is, you know, there's a, there's a point where we don't need to get all the details. Yeah, and I mean, to me, diseases are verbs, not nouns, right? You're cancering, you're heart diseasing. And when you look at it like that, you can't just look at that one cancer cell out of the body and say, I know what this is. It's how does that cell interact with the whole body? You know, an amazing trial was done about eight years ago. They took premenopausal women with breast cancer, and after optimal treatment, half got placebo and half got a drug that builds bone. Well, they reduced recurrence of the breast cancer by 40% from a drug that didn't even touch the breast cancer. Breast cancer metastasizes to bone, so you change the soil, the seed doesn't grow. And so it's a very important lesson is that we change the system somehow so that cancer didn't want to grow. We didn't mm-hmm. kill the cancer cell. Right. And if, you, if we think about it in, in, in the specific example of cancer, not you know, looking at other aspects of health, but cancer itself, it's, just, it, it's a cell that just wants to divide. Yeah. You know, it's all it does. I mean, it's not that different from the normal. We say, well, cancer is this beast. Cancer is our self that's a little bit changed. And we have, to, we have to figure out a way to attack it. You know, 1997, a 25-year-old kid came to the best cancer centers, and he had germ cell tumor of the brain, the lung, and the liver. And they told him, chemotherapy is going to make you sick. Are you sure you even want to get it? Well, he went to Indianapolis. And this is before Google, where you could search things and figure out where clinical trials were. And he got platinum, the same thing on my wedding band intravenously. Why? Because some goofball, and I use that term endearingly, doc, two platinum electrodes in a gel and said, do cancer cells like electricity or not? Well, the cancer cells didn't care about the electricity, but the platinum killed some of the cells, so they gave it intravenously. And a year and a half later, he won his first of seven tours de France. Hmm. And just last month, I mean, we were on stage together, and he said, David, why did platinum work to cure my disease? And I said, I honestly have no idea. Somehow it changed Lance Armstrong so the cancer didn't want to grow. And there's a lesson there. Yeah. But the the question is, you know, how do we how do we take that lesson when there are all sorts of 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 quacks, people who say they have a cure and they and they say, "Oh, I've got just the thing." And this this one person, this one person anecdotally was cured. So we're going to see that over and over. There are things that change the system in one person that somehow the disease may get better or in most of the cases they didn't have the disease they thought they do. One of my great cases was a woman came to me with a whole entourage thinking she had a lymphoma. And we looked under the microscope and she had mononucleosis. They would have given her chemo and they would have cured her or given her any and cured her because she didn't have cancer. That being said, we have to learn from every experience. And at the same time, we have to do things that have real data behind them for randomized trials. Mm-hmm. That's what people forget. You know, I get a lot of flack in the book because we talk about vitamins. 63 studies done that have been randomized with more than 100 people with vitamins and supplements. None have ever shown a benefit. The government has spent $247 million to look at vitamin E to prevent prostate cancer. After three years, 16% increase in prostate cancer, and it lasted for three or four years after stopping the vitamin E. I can go on and on. If smokers take beta carotene or vitamin A, 27% more lung cancer. 
And you look at these, there's never a positive. There are clear negatives over and over. If you give women over 70 high dose vitamin D, you increase the rate of bone fracture by 26%, not decrease, hmm. increase. So again, these things change our system. You need a couple of units of vitamin E a day, yet our pills are hundreds. We're all super size me, and they change our system over and over. Right. A lot of people, with the, with the vitamin issue, a lot of people say, well, whatever your body doesn't use, you pee right out. So your body's just going to take what it needs, right? So how could it hurt me? Because it changes your system. I mean, these are drugs. These are real drugs that change things. And so this notion of more, I mean, how many of your friends have ever had rickets, which is deficiency of vitamin D, or scurvy, lack of vitamin C? I guarantee you it's none. And all your friends may take these pills. There's something missing here. Yeah, I, I personally, I felt like the, the worst. Uh, I had this feeling of being the worst mother ever because I'm, I was a mom who didn't take uh, prenatal supplements. I made sure I had a diet that uh, was high, had a lot of uh, folic acid in it naturally. And so I have a varied diet. And I was like, I don't think, I, I don't feel like I need more vitamins. Well, that's a good point. I mean, so yeah, pregnant women, I think in general should take pre vitamins unless they're very smart and they know what they're doing like you did, right? Folic acid and things in pre vitamins clearly help with uh, maternal health and child health. But that's one of the few cases where there's real randomized data. Yeah, you were smart enough to get around that. Most people aren't. But in the other case where there is no data, it's egregious. Right. In, the ca- in, in, in how you think of yourself, do you think of yourself more as a scientist or a doctor? these days? You know, I'm both. I mean, I've got a lab of 30 people that w- works on new technology and new ways to fight disease. I mean, my lab is different, right? My teammates are a guy named Murray Gilman. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Murray discovered the quark string theory. He won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1969. Um, Danny Hillis, Danny built the first supercomputer, discovered RAID storage. So a remarkable engineer, a remarkable physicist, and a biologist cancer doc working together to understand disease. And how um, I, I, I read in the book about um, about how you work with Murray Gelman. How has he influenced you, and how has he changed the way that you approach your work? You know, the first time I met Murray, um, we did a series at the Aspen Institute where he was interviewing me on cancer, and he said, "You know, Galileo will go out every night and look at the stars in the sky, and after four months, he could tell you what every star was. Well, he didn't even know what a star was. You can map things. He talked about a concept called coarse graining." where you could actually take a downstream element that reflected everything going on upstream, like in climate modeling. They look at the shape of the cloud, and that shape tells you everything going on with the weather. It's all in there. You don't need to understand every parameter. You could just look at the shape of the cloud. Mm. And so in the cancer space, in the heart space, in the brain space, we really look at these reductionist things, and we don't take that step back. He told the story, if you take an egg and leave it in a room for three weeks and come back three weeks later, you have a rotten egg. You change the temperature to 99.5 degrees and rotate it three times. It has to be an odd number. You've got a chicken. So a small change in temperature and gravity go from chaos to order. Yet we really can't understand that and model that. Yet it happened. Right. right. And to look at disease differently. Again, like this verb concept. You're cancering. So I want to take you from a cancer state to a health state. I don't want to just shrink your cancer. I want to change you. And along those lines, when you when with with the title of the book, the end of illness, and how you uh, it, how you speak about the verbing of of different diseases, cancer itself is a multitude have, has a multitude of different causes. Cancer can come from a virus. It can come from something that is just genetically determined, epigenetic. There are, there are so many different different places where it can arise, um, and so. The end of illness, are you, are you really just talking about changing the person so that it prevents illness from having an environment where it can form? You know, 1951 was the last year in the United States you could die with the term old age on your death certificate. Ever since then, we need a cause of death. In the ninth decade, you know, you start to get engineering failure and the body starts to fall apart. I really believe most diseases we can prevent, not all, clearly, but most diseases we can delay or prevent. And I'm also an optimist, and I see it in your voice and how you did the news. You're an optimist, too. <laughs> What's happening with the drugs in the pipeline, the new technologies, is really powerful. So if we can le- keep people 
alive and healthy for the next decade or so, we're going to have treatments for the neurocognitive decline, for Alzheimer's, for cancers, for heart disease. So I want to be in delay mode. Listen, five separate studies with a quarter million people show that if you take a baby aspirin a day, you will do the death rate of cancer by 36%, presumably by blocking inflammation. Not the incidence, the death rate. So how can we as a society in the United States, where 16.5% of GDP is spent on healthcare and it's rising, not take that seriously and try to prevent disease? Let's talk about inflammation for a second and the the different causes of inflammation and, and what a person can potentially do in their life to reduce that. Because inflammation, uh, can, it, according to, to the news that I've been reading, the, the science that I've been, been seeing come out, it, it, it causes a, a, many of our ailments. So, you know, you were built with a very potent immune system. And evolution said, listen... I want to select out for a Dr. Kiki that has good kids, right? Evolution selects out for progeny Mm -hmm. and has good children. It doesn't select out for who lives till your 90s. And so once you're past childbearing age, so once you've been kind of 30s or 40, evolution no longer cares about you. And that's when disease happens. The cases of cancer in kids is very, very small in our country. And over 90% of them are cured. Disease happens later. And so we need to optimize once we get to our third and fourth decade. Inflammation seems to be the root of many problems. We know that mainly by interventional studies. That is, when you block inflammation, you can reduce cancer and heart disease. And at the same time, people who have inflammation in the individual organs, so if you've got ulcerative colitis or GI inflammation, you have a much higher risk of colon cancer. Smokers, lung inflammation, much higher risk of lung cancer. And you can go on and on. But we know there are several ways to reduce inflammation. One of the most dominant ways is taking a baby aspirin a day. There's a drug class called statins, mm-hmm. Lipitor-like drugs, that were developed to lower LDL, the bad cholesterol, but it turned out their dominant mechanism is blocking inflammation. So much so that during that swine flu epidemic a couple of years ago, or, or so-called academic epidemic, the only thing that prevented you from going on a ventilator if you got swine flu had been being on one of the statins. It worked. And there was a clinical trial taking people with normal cholesterol and putting them on a statin, and you significantly delayed heart disease and reduced the incidence of cancer in that regard. I want people to look at their profession and how they exercise. You know, football players have the shortest life expectancy of any profession, mainly because of the inflammation, as do many other athletes or athletic sports that kids play. I want you to say at the end of the day, if your feet hurt, you're wearing the wrong shoes. (laughs) <laughs> I want you to look at the exercise you do. And if you're really hurting after every time you exercise, you've got to stretch more or figure out some way to prevent that from happening. Yeah. So find different ways to be able to reduce the inflammation in your life. And, and, and like you said, if you feel pain, if you feel ache, there's probably some inflammation. And so you, can, you, can, you have cues in your own body that you can, that you can respond to. Well, look at this data. If you skip the flu shot, you would be fine, right? You'd be sick for four or five days. You'd go back to work and hopefully you wouldn't go to work with the flu and infect people, but you'd be fine. But those four or five days of inflammation through the roof, a decade from now will raise your chance of heart disease and cancer. So I want people to think not just about today, but also about tomorrow. And that's why things that reducing profound inflammation like flu shots work. In the case of statins, there was, a, I think in the news today or this, this week, there's a suggestion that the FDA make statins over the counter or more easily accessible to, to people. Do you think that would be a, a step in the right direction? It, you know, there, there are two sides, you know, so you can go to Walmart today and for $9, get a 90 day supply of statins without health insurance. So they're not tremendously expensive. You know, there's a lot of criticism of me on pushing drugs and pharma companies. You know, we're trying to push progress in preventing disease. Um, statins have problems and side effects. So nobody should take it obviously without talking to their doctor. Right. They slightly mm-hmm. increase the risk of diabetes, which is reversible. But remember the people who benefited the most in the studies were the people who actually got the diabetes. So even though they increase that, that's where you get the benefit. They have muscle problems in a very small percentage of people. Again, reversible if you stop it. So I want the conversation to happen with physicians. And I really believe it's going to be a partnership of patients and physicians that's going to make this happen. I wrote the book because I don't want docs making decisions without patients. I want that conversation to happen. So you can go in there with the data and really push your doctor and have that conversation and say, why shouldn't I be on a statin? Why shouldn't I be on an aspirin? And together make the right decision for you. 
in the in, in the sense of um, what information people should have, uh, where should where should you start? I mean, there are all sorts of cell data generating apps that you can get for your iPhone, or you know, there are all sorts of things that technology is bringing to us. But where does a person start to gather the information that they need to start talking to their doctor? So you know, in the book, we put a five page questionnaire going through all the questions. I want you to gather all that data. I want you to look at all the metrics about yourself. You know, you look at your stock portfolio four or five times a day. Your blood pressure is checked once a year and your doctor at one o'clock when you're there. I want you to check it in the morning when you get up, at night when you go to bed, when you're pissed off after a phone call. I want you to collect lots of data. And so the book goes through a list of five pages of all these things. I want you to look at yourself, look at the hair on your legs, look at how your body changes, all these aspects. So you go in armed with data. So that five, seven, ten minutes you have with your doctor, you can really make good use of it. Do you think uh, most people are, are still just in a reactionary uh, headspace in terms of medicine? There's something yeah. wrong. I go to the doctor. Yeah, I mean, you know, and doctors are also the same ways. They're they're motivated and financially motivated and and, and to treat. They're not motivated to uh, uh, prevent. Most of our healthcare dollars are spent in the last two years of life. I want to shift things earlier. I want to change prevention. You know, Michael Dell says, you're welcome to smoke a Dell computer, except I'm going to charge different for the smokers and the non-smokers for health insurance. I'm going to charge different for the obese and the non-obese for health insurance. As soon as you go on a weight loss program, you go back down to the regular price of health insurance. We need to bring in responsibility for healthcare. And we do that partly through information and partly through incentives for good behavior. You know, uh, I wear this little device that looks at how much I move during the day. Mm -hmm. And I'm shocked how much I sat. And I got one of those phones where I look like an air traffic controller. And I walk around the office when I talk on the phone. And I reduced in half the amount of time I sit. It makes a big impact on your health. And I think that's a, a big point, the awareness of, of what you're doing. Because a lot of people maybe just aren't aware of how much they're sitting or... Converse, conversely, how much they are doing something else that might not be so great for them. And so it's the it's the keeping track of your life that um, people probably find difficult, but is going to go a long way towards informing them and helping them in the future. Listen, we've got no choice. And if you look at the data, the data really are, you know, if you do your hour in the gym in the morning and then sit the rest of the day, that's the equivalent to smoking a pack and a quarter of cigarettes. And that's unacceptable. You need to move during the day. You know, one of the most profound effects on diabetes and general health is regularity and schedule. If you had your lunch today at noon and tomorrow at two o'clock for two hours, stress hormones go up. So you lower metabolism, you gain weight, you don't think as well, you don't exercise as well. And so it's the person who randomly grabs an apple during the day that hurts themselves. Apple every day at three o'clock, best thing in the world. The key is the regularity and schedule. You need to be aware of these things. You're right, keep the metrics, keep the data. Keep it in the cloud. Every time you have a test in your doctor's office, I want it stored in the cloud. If you have an EKG, I want a copy of it stored in the cloud. You never get sick nine to five on a Monday through Friday. It's always on vacation or at night when the records aren't available. Keep your records available to you and keep that data. In the in the question of uh, of personalized health care and what and where it's going, um, there there seems to be a lot of of technology that might be pushing us in the direction of people just being able to keep track of stuff for themselves, but will it, and maybe diagnose things for themselves? I mean, is the technology, you think, going to push us away from doctors? Or do you, do you think there's a role for the technology and the doctors to bring them together? You know, I, I don't think medicine right now is formulaic, and I don't think it's algorithm driven. I think it's an art. Um, and maybe one day that'll change as we get better and better technology, but it's an art. You know, you can have your genome sequence today. And then all that doing is it's telling you what could happen. Not what is happening. You know, if you're in front of two Chinese restaurants and you look at the ingredient list, they're exactly the same. And you taste the food. One could be great. One could be poor. Well, genetics is your ingredient list. It's just saying what's in the food. It doesn't say how it tastes. And so technology now is not at a point where it can really make decisions. It could just give pieces of data that together with the art of medicine make the right decision. And so right now, we need that partnership between physician and patients, and we probably always will. Part of that partnership, um, you, you mentioned genetics uh, as the one of the founders of Navi Navigenics. Do you think that knowing what's in our genes is a part of the equation, though, knowing exactly what we're dealing with? I certainly believe so. I mean, you need to know where to focus. You can't prevent everything. And so you have to look as an individual and say, based on my family history or my genetics, 
Remember, genetics is just a great family history. Most of our families, you know, my grandparents, it was a bad word, breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer. They never talked about it. And so genetics is a way we can get an accurate family history. And it really helps you focus on what you as an individual. You know, I thought it was important, but it wasn't religious. As soon as I saw my genetics on a piece of paper, it was a religious moment. I looked and I had a 46% chance of a heart disease. You know, when I launched the book, the first thing we did was we had a nightline where the Lighthouse anchor, Bill Weir, came into my office, 42 healthy guy, young kids. We sequenced his DNA live on TV, showed he was high risk for heart disease. Based on that, at 42, we got a heart scan and he had an 80% lesion, a blockage in his LED, the big artery in his heart. Wow. And so would he have had a heart attack? I don't know, but why take that risk? We can now prevent it. And that's the key is identify what you're up against and make action to prevent it. And in the book, you also talk about not uh, beyond genetics, the science of proteomics. Can you talk a little bit about the proteome and how using a drop of blood can potentially tell us so much in the future? You know, if you, in 1976, if you thought you were pregnant, we would take a tube of blood from you and we inject it into a rabbit. And then five (laughs) days later, we would kill that rabbit and look at the rabbit's ovaries. If they were enlarged, you were pregnant. That was the state of the art. The next year, 1977, a binary test came out. Yes, no. Told you if you were pregnant or not for $10. That was the first proteomic test. And so now rabbits of the world rejoiced. We changed dramatically returnal neonatal health. But at the same time, new technology came where you can know what's going on a moment in time. So the cover of the book that you showed earlier, that's one drop of blood going through a superconducting magnet with a 50 gigabyte image of all the proteins in the blood. That's the state of you that moment in time. So you have inputs. Your input is your genetics. It's what you eat. It's how you exercise. And the output's how you feel. Well, that middle state function, we've never been able to see before. And so for the first time now with proteomics, we can see it. And we have the real potential of knowing what's going on in you in a moment and doing the right thing. So instead of one size fits all medicine or giving everybody a drug, I hate saying everybody should take an aspirin or a statin. I would use a technology and say, listen, based on where you are today, this is what you need to do. And that's my hope for these technologies. Yeah, and, and like you mentioned, the, uh, the, the charting of yourself, if there were some way to be able to chart your own uh, proteome over time, you'd know when things were changing, you'd know exactly when something was different and something was up, as opposed to, I'm going to the doctor today because I don't feel good. Imagine a time, I mean, it's almost like Gattaca, where you go into the doctor, we prick your finger, we take a drop of that blood, it goes into a publicly available database, you populate the database with everything about you, and then it pulls out patterns and says what's going to go on in you. So every day, it's getting smarter, and it's learning. It's iterative. You know, when you search on Google, it's better than yesterday, right? And look what you did yesterday, and it actually improved the search. Medicine, I'm doing the same thing today as I did a decade ago, and that's wrong. We have to learn. and We have the potential with these technologies of really getting better. Yeah, along those lines, do you think that the uh, that the field of cancer research and cancer treatment is uh, that you can that you can move it forward by looking at it in a preventative way, just stopping it? Is this the way that it has to move forward? No question about it. I mean, we can't afford to keep treating cancer from a personal loss, from a society loss. We have to focus on the prevention side. And most of these cancers are preventable or we can delay the morbidity of them. And we have to take that seriously. We have to bring in responsibility to do it. You know, again, if we, everybody in our country over the age of 40 without a stomach problem or bleeding problem took a baby aspirin a day, so $2.11 a year, we would save $119 billion as a society. Why are we doing that? Wow. That's just a stunning number. Really? And then I look at the NIH budget and I say, listen, we're spending 30 plus billion dollars a year in research at the NIH. Yeah. You show 10 great examples in your news episode. But when you go to the NIH budget and say, what percentage of that is actually spent on understanding how aspirin works, making it better, preventing the side effects? The answer is almost zero. So I look at that and say, listen, we've got a remarkable clue here. It's not sexy. It's been around forever. We have to start to optimize there. We have to change how we do things. You saw in the news today, there's an amazing story of that there's a population in California, the very high incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And so a clinical trial was done, and it's really a unique trial because instead of going to the doctor saying, put patients on it, they went to the patients and say, listen, we want to prevent Alzheimer's disease before it happens. So it's a randomized placebo controlled trial in these patients. 
where they're trying to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Really the first one ever done in that regard. The government put up $100 million. There's a remarkable drug in testing now. And in two years, we'll start to have that example. That's where we need to go. Yeah, we need to, we need to, we need to save the money that we're spending on treating diseases so that we can move in the direction of actually preventing things before they happen, drug development research. Um, in the uh, in in the in the idea of uh, genetic analysis and going back to the the blueprint of who we are, there's a certain amount of uncertainty there. And how do you um, prescribe as we move forward? And like this year, at some point, we're supposed to have the thousand dollar genome that's going to be cheap or cheaper for people to be able to access their all of the all of the information in their genome as opposed to just the single nucleotide polymorphisms um it's just it's just numbers it's just data it's just it's just information how do we actually take that information and move forward so it's relative risk and relative risk helps make decision. We in our country said at age 50, the risk, benefit, costs of colonoscopy and colon cancer come together. We can prevent colon cancer. And that's when we should start to do it. But what do you say to the 3,400 people last year who died of colon cancer under the age of 50? We didn't meet those risk for work curves. So we need to understand relative risk better. It's not deterministic. These things are definitely going to happen in most cases although there are a couple rare examples, but we need to start to develop relative risk into making our decisions and say, here's the risk of a procedure, here's the risk of not doing something, and here's the risk of the disease itself and make a decision. It's gonna be a numbers game and we have to get better at doing that. There's not a yes, no answer. And everyone thinks medicine is binary. It's gray, it's black and white, it's all shades of gray. And I wanna take that decision, those shades of gray, which is funny now with all the book of shades of gray out there now, but I wanna take the shades of gray out there from the doctor's office and bring it to the patient. So they're involved in that decision because the value system of you and I go into those decisions. It's not just a data decision. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it could be just a data decision. And as we move into the more and more personalized healthcare, do you see it becoming ever more complicated? I mean, as you said, as as things get personalized, every person is different. Every person has a slightly different microbiome. Every person has a slightly different uh, makeup for uh, for their hormones, for what is normal for them. Is it going to become um, something that, that will be overwhelming for doctors to be able to deal with? Well, but that's, that's the difficulty, I think, is that when you get reductionist and start to look at every individual aspect, it does become overwhelming. But then when you start to what we call coarse grain and look at a downstream element that reflects lots of things upstream, it doesn't become overwhelming anymore. And I think that's how we have to think, is that inflammation, inflammation can reflect many things happening and if we target inflammation, those other things will fall into place. You know, you just saw the data in the New York Times today that HDL, we thought if you HDL was the marker, the good cholesterol. So if HDL is up, you're good, and we have to raise HDL. And we forget over and over these associations aren't necessarily causality. And so the data came out that HDL, if you raise it, doesn't dramatically affect heart disease or other diseases. And so this association was real, but it wasn't causal. Mm -hmm. Someone has a low vitamin D, and low vitamin D is clearly associated with cancer and heart disease. That doesn't mean giving more vitamin D corrects that. Association doesn't mean causality. And that's a very important lesson in healthcare. I think it's a fascinating lesson. That, and it's something that's very difficult for the human mind to be able to get past. Because the way things are reported, when you hear of a link, you're like, yes! I really want that to be true, and just at the the way the human brain works, the, the way our mind picks things up, we want there to be an easy answer. Or an easy way to blame, mm -hmm. right? So the World Health Organization said two years ago, well, cell phones could cause brain cancer. Why? Because they asked a couple thousand people with brain cancer how much cell phones they use, and they asked their spouses, because spouses are great controls. They eat the same, normally the same genetics, same environment two and a half or more cell phone users in the person with brain cancer than the spouse. They said there must be an association. You went back and audited the cell phone bills of the people, they're exactly the same. The person with brain cancer wanted something to blame. Right. They said, I must have talked on the cell phone before. In fact, three weeks ago, the data first time ever came out from 1970 till today, the incidence of brain cancer didn't change at all. Remember, we had no cell phones back then. And so if there really is an association, you'd expect glioblastoma or brain cancer to go up. It's right. not going up. 
Yeah, it's a, I, the hindsight is often often much clearer when you get more information. You're able to look at a story with greater accuracy to be able to get more information out to be able to to get a, just have a much clearer picture of the way things work. And to take a step back, remember my profession 25 years ago said take margarine, not butter, and we killed a couple of million people by doing that. We're very quick at well, this fat must be bad. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. Look at the data, and we have to say every time we make one of these big proclamations, is there randomized data in a really well done study showing that it will affect me as an individual or these people as a society? And in most cases, there isn't. We've got to stop making these proclamations. Do you think that doctors uh, need to, it, that these randomized controlled studies need to be, um, need to be, uh, informing doctors more do you think doctors aren't using them enough um i often we we hear a lot about a lot of medicine being practiced that's just not science-based really so i mean i looked at your science hour for the last couple weeks and every time you show you know your articles in your news section it's from the same journals it's the nature the new england journal of medicine the science there's a reason you're choosing those journals those journals have a filter where they take the best done science not always great but mostly large randomized study. They're not going to take a study of 10 people where they make a quick decision. And doctors have to learn to be discriminatory and so do patients. And we have to teach them that not all study is alike. We have to teach them that every decision will affect our complex emergent system, maybe in a bad way, maybe in a good way. And we can't just say something without real data behind it. I think that's a really, really good message. As we get into the... uh go into the future where do people need to what what points do they need to take with them they need to take with them that they're in charge of their health care and so this is a new era of medicine and so the era of medicine and the change in medicine is going to happen from the ground up not the top down the average time to 50 percent adoption by physicians of a new technology is 17 years and that's unacceptable and so we need to go into our doctors and arm with the data and say listen I've read about statins, where do I fall in? I've read about aspirin, I've read about exercise. I'm looking at my genetics, my data. I want you in charge of you. And that's a different way of approaching medicine and healthcare. And that's how we're gonna get changed to the positive. At the same time, we need to bring in responsibility for healthcare. If a child graduates college today and buys a General Motors car, over $2,000 of the price of the car is healthcare. And that's unacceptable. We need to start to bring in responsibility so we can lower incidence of disease and costs of healthcare. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, from writing your book, as we're getting to the end of the show here, what was, um, as, you, as you went through it, what do you think to you was the most important part of the book for you to write? You know, for me, you know, I mean, this was, I look at people two, three times a week and say, I'm out of drugs to treat you. And I'm going to, you know, you're going to die of your cancer. And I don't want to do that anymore. And so early on, I, I realized that m- much of what we have in medicine, we think everything is new and the technologies are new. And so much of there is in the past. You know, there's an amazing statement from Mark Twain saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it has rhythm. And if you start to look back in the book, what really affected me was that most of the things in medicine that are profound, we've made these observations sometimes 50 years ago, sometimes several hundred years ago. And we really have to listen to the past. Kids today in medical school never do autopsies. They never see real disease. Hmm. So we have to go back and read about disease and understand them. We have to go back to read about the natural history of untreated disease. We can really understand the interventions that we are making. And we have to learn from the past and we're not doing that now. We think that everything will be going forward. New technology, new ways of approaching. It's the marriage of the past and technology that will create the future. And what will you be doing as we move into the future? What are, your, what are your next steps? I mean, my next step is continue what I'm doing, which is this concept of convergence. You know, people say this is the century of biology. It's not. It's the century of convergence of physics, math, biology, chemistry all together. And so I'm honored to work with physicists, engineers, mathematicians. I want to bring in new people to think about how to approach these diseases. And, you know, I'm still there in the laboratory with my team figuring out ways to do that. We need to get new ways of approaching it. I want to get video gamers to look at all the things happening in the body and say, mm-hmm. what happened and how do we approach that? I want to get different ways of approaching it because the people in my space, me included, we have, we failed. It hasn't worked what we've done. Hmm. 
And as far as um, promoting your book and your book tour, have you been able to stick to a regular schedule? <laughs> <laughs> we try. Um, you know, I mean, you can't be totally religious about it, but you've yeah. got to try. And so certainly, you know, it's an honor to do all the press associated with the book. Um, I'm shocked by the response. You know, I've never had hate emails in my life, and now I get thousands of people who are anti, you know, I've lived on vitamins, they saved my life, how can you say this? At the same time, you get many of the other side where you've helped people, and it's an honor to do it. Well, I hope that as you move forward, the, the hate mail becomes less and less, and that uh, there become, there, that, that there's more and more appreciation uh, for your ideas, because... Um, it's getting past the entrenched ideas that we have using science and data to be able to build new paths forward that are it's really the, really what's going to help us and I think books like yours The End of Illness are um, a, a way that people can learn to do that in their own lives which is really great well thank you I mean your show is fantastic the concept of educating people about science I truly believe in so thanks for doing what you do Thank you very much. Everybody, if you are interested in more of uh, D- David Agus's work and more information about him, you can go to his website, davidagus.com. And his book, once again, is The End of Illness. And it's a, a really great read. There's a lot of stuff in it. He doesn't give you recipes. So there's, there's no recipes, but it, there's a lot of great information for uh, healthier ways to live. And... That's it for the Science Hour. That does it. I'm Dr. Kiki, and this has been Dr. Kiki Science Hour. Next week, we're going to be talking about environmental contaminants with Arlene Bloom. And uh, until then, you can follow me on the social interwebs. I'm Dr. Kiki on Twitter, Facebook, Kiki Sanford on Google+. And you can download past episodes of this show at twit.tv slash kiki. I have another program called This Week in Science that it airs on Thursday nights at on twit.tv as well. You can get to that show at twist.org. And additionally, on Fridays, I do the science chat on Justin TV slash Dr. Kiki. I hope that you will join me for one of those programs. But if not, this one, this is the one to come to. Remember, I ask for only one hour a week, and I do hope that this hour makes your world a whole lot more interesting. Now for your science meditation of the week. In this paper, two people with tetraplegia, that is two people who were unable to move their arms or their legs in any functionally useful way, were able to control a prosthetic or a robotic arm simply by thinking about the movement of their own paralyzed hand. And they did that using the investigational BrainGate neural interface system. So they thought about using their own arm and hand as though they were reaching out themselves with their own limb. And the robotic arm moved much the way their own arm would have moved. One of the longstanding questions, not only in neuroscience, but in neurorehabilitation, is whether the cells in the motor cortex and other parts of the brain, whether they continue to function the same way years after that original injury. It is possible for people to use their thoughts to control devices, either a computer or a robotic arm. And the way that happens is that we implant a tiny sensor, just about the size of a baby aspirin, just into the surface of the brain. And that sensor pick up the electrical impulses from a a bunch of neurons. And each of those little neurons are like radio broadcast towers, putting out impulses. And when they get to the outside, a computer translator converts the pattern of pulses into something that is a command. One of our participants was able to do something uh, that, when all of us saw it uh, for the first time, uh, gave us all pause. She reached out with the robotic arm. She thought about the use of her own hand. She picked up that thermos of coffee brought it close to her, tilted it towards herself, and uh, sipped the coffee from a straw. And that was the first time in nearly 15 years that she had picked up anything and been able to drink from it solely of her own volition. There was a moment of, of true joy, true happiness. I mean, it was beyond the fact that it was an accomplishment. Uh, uh,